Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? Doing great today, Tim. I hope everybody out there is doing well as well and very happy to be bringing this conversation with a wonderful woman to our listeners' ears. But before we get to that, the thing I want to bring to the listeners' ears is how you're doing. Fill their ears with how you're doing. I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. I'm always better when we speak to one of our pod friends, Lance. And this conversation, we speak with Esther Ludlow of Once Upon a Crime. You can find out about everything she does at truecrimepodcast.com. Probably the best URL in the biz, Lance. How much do you think she had to pay Mike Morford to get that URL? I think she beat Morph to this one because I don't think Morph would have given it up. And Once Upon a Crime is a great show. Definitely check that out. It's a weekly true crime podcast that tells the story behind the story of real life crime. And Esther does a great job exploring why people do what they do. And she's endlessly fascinated by that. And you can hear that in her voice. Uh, it's a really great conversation. She takes a lot of what she's learned through her background in psychology and applies it to each episode, applies it to each case. She sure does. And in this conversation, we talk about her Bands Gone Wild series, which is just one of the things we talk about. That was a fun conversation, Lance. And it's great to get a more candid experience with Esther because most of her programming is scripted and she's trying to work herself into this non-scripted conversational style. And honestly, I was really happy that she used us as one of her practice sessions to get that conversational style going. And she obviously does a great job. She's super engaging. Well, you know what else is a good listen, Lance? It's Crawl Space premium Ooh. and you can get that at crawlspace.supportingcast.fm or you can subscribe via apple podcasts in your apple podcasts app well i'm gonna go over and subscribe right now you won't see i say that every week tim and then you say you won't and i don't well you should and while you're at it <laughs> follow us on social media at crawlspace podcast or crawlspace pod and give us five stars if you got an extra few seconds. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And before we get to Esther Ludlow from Once Upon a Crime, we are going to take the quickest of quickest breaks to hear a word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Esther Ludlow, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Doing fantastic. Very happy to have you on the show today. Even though you are a bit under the weather, you said? You said you visited a very cold location and you weren't used to it. I don't want to get too personal with your story and I want you to speak for yourself, obviously. But in the face of your health being at risk you joined us here and we appreciate it yeah it's just one of those things it's funny now like uh, after covid if you get a little bit of the sniffles or it's like everybody's like back off get away from me you know but no i'm a california girl and uh not used to anything under like about 65 degrees so <laughs> i was in portland oregon and it was a, a little bit colder than that i think i just got a little bit of a sore throat but yeah i'm pretty much over it for the most part so hopefully it will sound okay well it sounds great and I hope you're ready for the marathon three-hour interview that we're about to embark <laughs> upon. <laughs> well, Esther, tell us about your podcast. I, I mean, well, tell us about you first. I want to know a little bit about you. How long have you been doing your podcast? How did you get the URL truecrimepodcast.com and so forth? Well, that should tell you about how long I've been doing the podcast that I have, truecrimepodcast.com. Yeah, I actually was a big fan of podcasts from you know, way back when nobody knew what that was. Like most people, I guess, probably listening to current events and politics and, you know, talk shows, whatever. I've always been a really big true crime fan as far as you can call them a fan. I read a lot of true crime books when I was starting like in high school. But the first book that I picked up was The Stranger Beside Me about Ted Bundy, written by Anne Rule. And that took me down a rabbit hole. Started reading a lot of those um, and just kind of followed. And the thing was about that, I have this really bizarre brain where details about true crime and all the worst things in the world. If I read it 20 years ago, I remember it like yesterday. Other things like when I'm supposed to stay at the grocery store, I forget in five seconds. So that was one of those things. And everybody would say, oh, you remember that case about that thing that happened in Lake Tahoe? And I'd be like, oh, yeah. And I could tell them everything about it. When I started listening to podcasts, thinking, man, it'd be really cool to do a true crime podcast. I know all these stories. I could just tell stories. But I thought nobody wants to listen to that. That's terrible. Thinking that, I started looking to see if there was true crime podcasts. And this was about 
2012, 2011, 2012, I found um, a couple. I found the Generation Y, which I'm wearing their their sweatshirt today. It was like my top true crime podcast. I was so happy to find a podcast like that and that discussed true crime cases. So I really started learning on my own how to podcast in about 2012. And I just did like a couple of little hobby podcasts just to learn how to do it. Because in those days, there was no school of podcasting. You know, everything was... Uh, Like you guys know, piecemeal, you figure it out as you go, right? So it was fun. It was something I was doing in between. I was uh, also at the same time I was in graduate school, I was uh, earning a master's in correctional psych of all things, which was working with people that had been incarcerated, criminal psychology. I mostly was working with youth that came out of the juvenile justice system to kind of, you know, help them to transition back into society and, and not end up back in prison as an adult. So got a lot into the minds of people who commit crime and what motivates them, what happens. Of course, there's, you know, lots of different stories about that and ways you could take it. So I thought when I started the podcast, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll tell these stories, but I'll also try to get maybe a little bit into the motivation, backgrounds of the bios of the victims, which is one of the things I really liked with the Anne Rule books is she always did the bios of all the the victims and the perpetrators and, and everybody. So you could kind of come to a conclusion of maybe how all this happened. And that's really my thing is, is really liking to chew on that. Like we would never think to do or never think that we'd find ourselves in a situation. How do they happen? And you really have to look at all the players and the situation and the environment and everything else to understand it. So, or at least try to understand it. And I could say we're ever going to truly understand it to get some idea. So that's kind of what I did. So I ended up thinking about it for a long time, learning how to podcast, trying to, you know, getting everything set up and finally launched in June of 2016. I launched Once Upon a Crime with three episodes. The way I do it is just because I was trying to think of enough cases at one time to do because I was going to do one case for each episode. I have a very short attention span. So <laughs> so I can't stay on a case for like a year or something. I don't think at least I've never tried that. So I thought, well, if I do one case an episode and just, you know, in half an hour, 45 minutes, I think I can I can do that. Of course, it ended up being more than that. So I started out that, well, let me pick a topic, like a type of crime. Maybe there's something that fits into a topic and then I'll do three or four cases on that topic and just change it every month. So that's kind of how it started. The first series I did, I guess called series per month called um, Lost and Found, which was about people that had gone missing and then were found uh, years or decades later. So I did the JC Dugard case up here in Northern California. I did the Cleveland kidnappings, the three women that were abducted and held up to like 10, 11 years. And what was the last one? I always forget the last one. Oh, it was Elizabeth Smart out of Utah, Salt Lake City, that she was taken by the the crazy guy that he like took her down to San Diego and they were camping in this desert hills and stuff. It was crazy. So it was basically just me finding cases that I was always really interested to know more about, putting them together like in a series and then just telling the stories one by one. So I always say, what's about a crime? I tell like a storytelling style because it really is me telling a way that I think is compelling to unfold the story from beginning to end. It's amazing that you have that whole journey from being interested in true crime with the Ted Bundy, I guess, experience that you described. And that made a memory pop out in my head about the time that he was executed. And I remember seeing the people outside of the prison who are there with like support signs for the execution, like all of these individuals out there supporting the execution. And I think I had the same thought at the time as well. What makes these people tick and why why aren't these people curious? about what made Ted Bundy do what he did. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I never really thought about that moment in my life before until you said you are really looking into the why. Also, really good work with transitioning youths back into regular society. Also something that goes back into what makes people do what they do. And if you can get to them early, talk to them and explain to them and learn from them, I think that's hugely important. I do always think about that, I think I learned way more from them than they learned from me because their experience was so different. I mean, I'd had my own experiences as a, as a teen, young adult, like challenges and, and things like that. But theirs, of course, were completely different. It really did help me to, I guess, just have more empathy for people. And that's the thing you guys maybe have this issue, too, when you're covering crime and criminals. You don't want to, like, excuse what they did. But you want to understand, and sometimes you do have empathy for maybe how they got there. So it's not like, you know, you're like saying, oh, you know, give them a pass because they had this terrible 
childhood. Well, a lot of people have ter- terrible childhoods and I dealt directly with some of them and they didn't do such terrible things. There's always that in the back of my mind. I research these cases like crazy and I can research these cases and look under every rock to see like what, it, okay, but what could cause this person to do this? And sometimes you can't find anything like that. It's a choice. For some reason, they just enjoy it. They enjoy, you know, being this terrible person or doing these terrible things. And sometimes, and it's only a handful that I found like that, I really cannot find the hook. It just seems like they just decided one day to do this, unless there's something we don't know. Ted Bundy is a great example because we don't know. He always talked like he had a great childhood. Everything was wonderful, which, you know, it's highly doubtful, but There are certain things that I take because of my psychology background, because he did a lot of interviews. Who's the guy, the FBI guy that does all of the forensic linguistics stuff? Roy Hazelwood. Okay, it takes apart the JonBenet Ramsey letter or, you know, all those things, right? I was was really impressed. (laughs) It it might be him. He's been on a bunch of those shows. Yeah, I was thinking him or it could. I was also thinking like Jim, not Jim Clementis, the other guy got a uh, wrestler. There's a whole bunch of them. I, I I was way into all of the FBI profiling kind of stuff and all that from way, way back. So I get them mixed up, too. But if you look at his words, some of the things he says in, in the phrases he uses, it's weird. I was listening to one of them and he said something and it. It made the hairs on the, on the back of my neck stand up. And I thought the, the thing I immediately thought is. He's heard that himself. He's heard that himself. He was abused by somebody, whether it was verbally abused or physically abused or some kind of abuse. And he heard that himself because he like embodied that statement. It was such a cold, cold statement that I thought he's heard that somebody said that to him. And so it's like, it was like this little click of a light bulb. I don't know what it means. I just know it's true. And and it's the same thing when I was counseling, when I get in a little click of something and I'm getting into their head, I'm like, okay, I get a little portion of maybe what makes them tick. And maybe I can work with that. It's really fascinating to me. It's harder to do when we're researching cases we're not directly connected to, but it is still possible. It's still possible if you get, especially their own words, if you can find it in you know court records or interviews or something like that, it helps a lot. So what I'm hearing is you're sort of disturbed when you can't figure out a why someone commits a crime. Are those the cases that you feel like you have to explore on your podcast? I'm already exploring them by the time I find out that I can't find something, I'm already kind of in the middle of putting it together for an episode. So sometimes it just happens that way. It is a head scratcher. I I do find it fascinating. It doesn't make me like want to keep trying to figure it out. Sometimes I just, and it's the same thing when I was working with individuals or sometimes it's like, you know, I don't think that I'm going to be the right person to make a connection with this person or get them to open up or whatever. And it is just what it is. You cannot be tied to the outcome. That's what's really important when working with people, when working with cases, which is, of course, hard for all all of us armchair detectives, right? But we really can't be tied to the outcome because there's so many variables that you're never going to know if it's going to be able to be solved, if you're ever going to be able to figure out why it happened, if you yourself are ever going to feel satisfied that justice was done, you cannot ever, you know, count on that. I mean, we know this from research in true crime and following cases and whatever. If people that do that, they tend to really, I think, kind of harm themselves in some ways, because just like your own life, you cannot be in control of everything. You know, you certainly can't be in control of somebody else's life or or story. When I'm doing these episodes and I I really get into it and and I put all this together, when I'm done with it, I'm done. I walk. It's like, I don't think about it almost ever again. So people ask me to talk about cases. I have to look up my notes. And it was the same thing. It's weird because it's the same kind of um, strategy. I guess it's a strategy. I've never really thought about it. But when I was counseling, because when I'm sitting somewhere and they're telling me their worst, you know, worst things that have happened to them and, and all of this stuff and a lot of trauma you're dealing with, you cannot hold on to that. Because if you do, it will affect you in your own personal life. The thing that I always tell, told myself then and I tell myself now as I'm researching these stories and telling these stories is it's not my story. It's not my story. So I don't have to hold on to it. I don't have to be affected by it. I have empathy. I have compassion. I want to understand. But at the end of the day, when I'm done and I feel like I've done the best job I can telling their story, then I walk away because it's their story, not mine. And that's just kind of how I get away from when people say, does it you ever have nightmares or does it follow you? No, never. I have never once dreamt about a case I've covered ever. 
now that I can remember anyway. I think that was my psychology, my counseling background that really helps me with that because you learn to not not be tied to the outcome and not hold on to other people's trauma because it's not yours. Really interesting statement there. It has to have something to do with your psychology background. And I'm curious if you, tapping into that background, think that there's a line where someone can not be rehabilitated. One of the things I say when I'm looking for what cases I'm going to cover is I try to find something that hasn't, something that makes it more interesting. And again, that has to do with that choice somebody makes to commit a crime or whatever, whatever it is. I don't tend to take cases that we know the reason why the person committed this, this terrible act is because they were extremely mentally ill because we know why they did it. We know they were mentally ill. They were not in their right mind. And that's like the legal definition of insanity, right? So if it's that, which is, of course, those are rare cases. If it's that, then I wouldn't cover it because there's really nothing to dig into there. You know, I mean, you could talk about what happened. You know, that may be interesting to to some people, but it really doesn't hold a lot of interest for me. It's like it's a terrible thing that happened. So it always has to be something where there's something you can dig into a little bit and look at that. The goal is to see if there's something that as a, a general population, we can understand about it. You know, maybe it will inform something in our own lives or the lives of people that we care about that we can maybe pay attention to, get somebody some help, talk to some, you know, talk to people, whatever needs to happen. That's really as far as it as it goes for me. Yeah, I don't do a lot of advocacy. I feel like I did that in my like my day job when I used to have that day job, <laughs> which the podcast took over. So I don't have that day job anymore. And so now I just want to, you know, I just want to tell stories. I don't want to, I don't want to like, I think there's so many other people that are doing great work, like wrongfully convicted or, you know, just other things like that. And I just don't feel like I have the chops for that. <laughs> so I kind of stay away from it. Well, I think you have the chops for whatever you want, Esther. <laughs> I'm curious, do you get messages from listeners? What have you gotten more messages about? Like what case that you've covered has stuck with your listeners? You know, it's funny. I've always heard that from, oh, you get all these messages and all this feedback. And I'm like, you do? Because I don't. <laughs> I, or maybe I don't know where to look. Um, I, I, I don't get a lot of email. I, I don't know. It's weird. People that listen to Once Upon a Crime and then like will see me on this or hear me on, on, on your podcast will say, oh gosh, he's very different from what I thought. They, I've always get that because I tell the I tell it as a very, like I said, put the research together. I write it. I narrate it as a, you know, as a story with a lot of facts and details and theories and psychology and stuff in there a little bit. And they think I'm a very serious person. <laughs> and then they meet me like at Crime Con or something. And they're like, oh, God, you're not... <laughs> You're not at all what we expected because it's all it's a lot of, you know, joking around and 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 stuff like that. So this is what I've heard when I met people in person is they've said, I wanted to like ask you a question, but I was kind of like intimidated to do that. Like I just like, oh, she's so serious, you know, and this is why Bob Ruff from Truth and Justice and I get along so well, because everybody thinks he's like that. No, and not at all. So when we met, we were like, you know, like like kindred spirits because it was like, Oh my God, you're like that. Oh my God, I'm like that too. Like, <laughs> and people think you're like that. Yeah, people think I'm like that too. So, uh, so yeah, so I think that's why maybe I don't get a lot. But yeah, there are cases that definitely people resonate with a lot more than others. Um, and just looking at the ones that get downloaded a lot, the ones that I see people maybe mention on Reddit or something when people are talking about a case is uh, there's the John List case. That is the one where the guy was the family annihilator and killed his whole family and then disappeared for like 17 years and was caught, but had another identity and all this stuff. He was the very first case that was featured on America's Most Wanted. I didn't remember that. I know I saw it, but I didn't remember it. When I covered the case, I was covering, um, I believe I was doing, I think I was doing Family Annihilators at that time. I think that's what the topic I was doing. And I found him. He was one of the you know ones everybody talked about. That one, for some reason, is is huge. The Cleveland kidnappings, the three girls that got the one in my very first episodes, the girls that were, all three were abducted and kept captive by this this one man in this house in Cleveland. That's another one that people do a lot. And then the women, the women that are the murderers, people really gravitate to those like Jody Arias and Betty Broderick and Diane Downs of Pacific Northwest that said that she was carjacked and her kids were shot and 
Turns out, you know, she was the one that, that did it. I do mostly older cases, ones that are concluded, but I am endlessly fascinated by these cases that have been covered a lot in the past. Maybe not so much when I started. Now, of course, you know, <laughs> now, now, of course, it's, it's a, you got, you got to really wade through it to, to find something that somebody hasn't covered. But I still, I will still watch and listen to everything on John Benet Ramsey. That's just me, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know. There's those cases that you're just, fascinated by, right? You know, see if there's anything else, maybe somebody knows. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those for you. Yeah. Lance was was speaking with John Ramsey uh, at CrimeCon this past year. How random is it that what you do in your life before being a true crime podcaster is so different than what you're doing when you are a true crime podcaster? And would I ever have thought that I was going to be speaking with John Ramsey? No. Like, it's it's so surreal. When I saw that he was going to be there because I was there as well, I was like, oh, my God. God, that was like, John Ramsey, that's crazy. Like, I didn't get to see him speak because I was too busy with, uh, you know, I couldn't get away. But I did think that I thought, I don't think I could talk to him. I think I'd be so like intimidated. I don't know why it would, but I just, it felt like it would be really, <laughs> really, I think I thought I'm going to, if I stood in front of him, I'd probably be like that. Eh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because like, I don't know what that is, but there's something it's weird, you know? But yeah, I can imagine that'd be totally surreal to actually speak with him. And it wasn't even planned. It was that we were getting ready to leave. It was the very end of Crime Con, and he just happened to be there with the person who was assisting him. You know, it's an opportunity that you have to take advantage of right there. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. So Esther, I know on your fabulous podcast, Once Upon a Crime, that you like to sort of deviate from your usual release calendar, I suppose, in uh, October. You do something a little bit more conversational, casual, I suppose. This time I, I did that. And I usually do it that way. Eh, now and again, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Um, I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> Well, I thought it was great. I, I listened to your Bands Gone Wild series, and uh, I thought it was fascinating to hear about Guns N' Roses, The Cure, NWA. Yeah, you know, that was one of the things that I always wanted to do. I mean, if I ever had any time, that would be something I would do, would, would be focusing on crazy things that happen in the world of like music and musicians, because I love all that. I read a lot of uh, like musician biographies and things like that. And the stories are crazy, right? I mean, they're just so fascinating and just a whole different world. So that was one of the things I knew that I was going to do once upon a crime was I was going to try to incorporate some crime cases that had to do with musicians and bands and things like that. And way early on I did, it was called uh, The Day the Music Died was the name of the series I did. And one was on Marvin Gaye. Um, who was shot and killed by his father. And I was like, what the hell happened there? Because I remember when that happened and thinking, what? Like, uh, this is definitely a story. So I did that one. I did an episode on Selena, of course, uh, killed by her fan club president. And I also did uh, a episode on uh, Tupac and Biggie. I and mean, those are huge stories, but I kind of just condensed it into, you know, those two stories. And then... I did one about, you know, John Lennon being killed, started doing Rocktober. So I would try to do something. October is my favorite month because I love Halloween, of course. A little bit more fun, something Halloween themed or whatever. I did one about the uh, Laurel Canyon mansion that was supposedly haunted. And that's where a lot of the, a lot of bands recorded, like Red Hot Chili Peppers recorded there and Slipknot and and other people. Um, it just was a cool house and supposedly it's really haunted. So uh, those were fun to do. One of them that, that I really enjoyed doing a lot was about the Altamont. It was supposed to be like a Woodstock of the West. Altamont is up here in Northern California. It's just in the middle of nowhere. It used to be um, like a racetrack there. They ended up having this called, Rolling Stones came and all these other bands, Santana and um, a whole bunch of bands. And it just became a, a complete free for all. And there was a, a stabbing there and one of the fans died. The Hells Angels were supposedly hired as security, which, you know, they were involved in the murder. So that was an interesting story. But those are more scripted. I did Bob Marley assassination attempt. I, so anything I can find that was like has to do with bands, I try to do. So October this time, I decided I'm gonna do a little bit different. 
because I was reading all these stories about these crazy uh, riots and things at concerts or things that happened at concerts. And it was this article I found something about the the bands that the worst nightmares on tour, you know, <laughs> like and of course, you're going to talk Ozzy Osbourne, you know, back in the day and and, and stuff like that. Uh, and of course, you're going to talk Axl Rose. So you're going to talk Guns N' Roses because, you know, the guy was just you know, unhinged. And I really wanted to know a little bit about his story. And I say I followed the band when I was younger and all of that. I, but I really didn't know a lot about him. And as we know, just a lot of stuff happened going on with him. So I did the one, it was the Riverport riot when he was then outside of St. Louis. He got mad and left the stage and then the fans just went nuts. So he, got, but actually before that, he tried to jump, jump in the crowd and, and fight with a fan and like at this 20,000 seat arena, right? So it just became mayhem. And the other thing too, is because of that background in psychology, I had a background in social psychology, where you talk about the psychology of, of crowds, of how riots happen. And there's elements that are, that are involved in it that uh, usually tend to contribute to it. If you put these elements together, you could probably guarantee there's going to be a riot, you know, kind of thing. And of course, they come together in circumstances like the Rodney King, you know, the the Rodney King verdict, and then the riots happened in LA. And I lived here in California at that time. And that was scary as hell. That was just, if somebody has not, I, and I didn't even, even live that close to it, but being here, watching it live on television at the time, you know, living alone, I was, I was younger, I was single, and it was, it was terrifying what the hell is happening? <laughs> and then knowing that these things happen at concerts. I used to, oh, I went to lots of concerts. I still go to some. And it was always just so fun and upbeat and high energy and just everybody's just having a great time. And I'm like, well, how does this happen? I want to know. So that was the catalyst for looking into some of these stories. Like I said, I'm a big music fan and I just love all this. I decided to do it a little bit more conversational. I didn't script it as much, but I did have all the all the details and stuff and then just kind of talked about it because I wanted to kind of interject my own thoughts about it or, or, or feelings about it as I was talking about it. I just want to get your take on this. Speaking of horrible individuals in the music industry, rock and roll stars, I don't typically rejoice when people die, but I had part of me, a little glimmer, ray of sunshine in my heart when Jerry Lee Lewis died recently. He was 130 years old. Somehow, he signed a deal with a darker entity and managed to live as long as he did, despite the fact that he tried to kill himself with alcohol, drugs, I mean, everything imaginable. He was literally a killer. That was his nickname. And then he just reinvents his career as like a gospel singer or something. The irony. <laughs> that was a story that I had heard about, about his wife that was found dead in, in their house. Real obvious that he had to have something to do with that if he didn't, you know, just beat her to death or whatever, but never, you know, totally walked on it. I actually, I forgot about that. I covered that case as a discussion with Erica from Southern Fried True Crime. So I have that on 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 as well. It was, you know, if people look up the, the I have a few handful of your guest hosts and, and she, cause you know, Southern Fried True Crime. So she knew about the story as well, but that one always stuck with me because I'm like, they, like you said, they literally call him the killer. Come on. Plus the fact that oh, he married his 13 year old cousin or something like 15 years. That was crazy. So, I mean, just, yeah, the guy was just not a good dude, man. Just not a good dude. It's amazing. That when I did that, people said, I never knew that. I never knew that. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's one of those things that you think everybody would have heard about, but no. He was so good at the piano. <laughs> he lit it on fire. <laughs> I don't know. Oh my god. OJ was good at carrying a football. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if in his research to play Jerry Lee Lewis, if Dennis Quaid in the movie Great Balls of Fire like actually learned about all of those things and did he have any sort of like compromise inside himself? Because if you watch that movie, I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis is a hero, like the bad guy that no one understands, but he's got a heart of gold. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, you wonder. Yeah, you wonder about that. Did the producers give him a bunch of material and redact a bunch of things about Jerry Lee Lewis? I remember correctly, I believe that Jerry Lee Lewis was around, like, he kind of, like, worked with him to to learn some of his mannerisms and how he played the piano and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, he was involved. <laughs> Was he like, by the way, I killed my first wife? <laughs> yeah. And now I'm a preacher or whatever he was. He said he was. It's crazy. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, people do that all the time. They reinvent themselves, I guess, or try to. Well, my heart rejoiced when I saw that message pop up as a notification on my phone. I had a no. I little was like, Are these right after after thinking like, I, is this an old notification from thirty years ago? Because I could have sworn <laughs> that he was <laughs> he yeah. was ninety in yeah. the seventies. Oh my god! And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. I find Marvin Gaye's story uh, very tragic, his father killing him. And uh, I find it especially ironic, too, after Marvin Gaye's song, What's Going On? And he's singing, Father, Father, War is Not the Answer. And then later he's shot and killed by him. Yeah, they had a very complicated um, relationship, very complicated relationship. It's one of those those things that you're like, he should never have been around his father. You know, especially at the time, because Marvin Gaye had a, a big drug and alcohol problem himself, um, still, you know, dealing with stuff from his past and not never getting over. It. And of course you become this, you know, rich headliner and all this kind of stuff. And you got more money than you need to do drugs and whatever. And that's kind of what happened. He really spiraled down at the end there. As a matter of fact, my brother had told me, I didn't even know this, that he had gone to see Marvin Gaye, uh, in a concert, like the year before he died. And he goes, he was a mess. He didn't look good at all. I go, really? And he goes, I, I, go, I didn't know that. And uh, he said, yeah, he just, he couldn't remember words. It was obviously there was, he was not okay. And then he's living in a house with his parents. He has his parents moving in the house with him where him and his dad had this, this terrible relationship and his dad could still get to him. His dad could just say something like you're a loser, you're whatever. And it would still like eat at him, you know, even though he was the success and everything else, it just, he never got over that, you know, being rejected by his dad. And yet, dad's living there. It was a very bad situation. Plus guns in the house and not a good situation at all. How did you find the story about the cure? Because when you think about the, you know, the bad boys of rock and roll, I mean, when you think about criminal type behavior in rock and roll, you do think about guns and roses, but I don't know, maybe, is it me? I never really considered the cure to be those like wild boys. <laughs> no, I know it was so funny when I found out about the, you know, what was happening in the earlier days, you know, they started out like in 77 or something. They were really, I mean, they were like 18, you know, when they first got signed in the UK, they didn't really come here to the States till the early eighties is when I think I first started, you know, uh, following the band and stuff like that. So I didn't know about their first couple of years, but they were crazy. And yeah, you wouldn't think so. We always think of them as this like kind of emo goth dudes, you know, like sitting around just, you know, chill it out and whatever. But yeah, no, they were wild the first couple of years when they went out on the road because they just had never been anywhere, done anything. They were also trying to, it was like they were trying to embody this persona of these rock stars, I think, because they didn't, I mean, when you're, come on, when you're 17, 18, you don't know who you are yet. You have no idea, right? <laughs> you're just trying on things. And now they have all these people looking at them. And, and Robert Smith was always very an introvert. He was a piano player and that's all he wanted to do is play the piano, but that wasn't cool. You know, so him and some friends started a band. And of course, now you could be a musician. And, and, and he was always the more sensitive. He was the writer. He was the poet. He's the one that wrote all of their lyrics and stuff like that. But he would get very into his feels about it. And so that's not cool. But being a rock star is cool. So now they go out on the road and he still has this very sensitive. This is why I read it anyway. He has this very sensitive kind of um, 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 constitution about him. But now he's got to be this, you know, cool rock star. So he just goes overboard in being like, you know, mayhem on stage and and like, I'm going to fight everybody and, you know, all this stuff. They would be at their concerts, him and Simon, Simon Gallup, and they would just like fling themselves in the audience and start beating on people. They don't care who it was. They could be six foot five dudes, you know, <laughs> security guards. <laughs> and I think they just had this 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 idea that we got to prove ourselves as tough guys or something. I don't know. It was crazy, man. It was so crazy. So yeah, when I heard about that, I go, oh, I need to find out more about this because this does not, like you said, it doesn't track what, what we think about the cure at all. But yeah, they're pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, quite quite a bit of mayhem. And then the the the, the, the culmination being the band itself gets in a fist fight on stage at a major concert. <laughs> and it's like, okay, the band's over. <laughs> It really reminds me of the first time Tim and I did a panel at CrimeCon when we launched ourselves into the crowd and just started throwing fists. Oh, man, you guys should totally do that next time. <laughs> 
I remember I, I put Bob Ruff into a headlock that he'll he'll never forget. <laughs> you, you you have to do it, man. You have to do it because it, you'll you'll be the, you'll be the hit of crime con. <laughs> yeah, will be your follow up episode. Podcast after, has after, gone wild after, after you get out of the emergency room. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, gosh. Esther, what's next? What are you What are you doing next on your show? Well, she's finishing watching The Watcher. First of all, <laughs> I am actually. I have two more to go today, and I have a lot of stuff to talk to you guys about. That that's going to be amazing. So yeah, I'm gonna have. I, this is you guys. You know, first, I don't know when you guys are, are putting this out, but you'll hear it here first that uh, Tim and I are going to be on my show. We're going to be talking about The Watcher because in December, I have a special guest on where I finally get to watch something, immerse myself in something to crime that's not something that I'm writing about, but I just get to have a, a really fun discussion and talk about true crime with with some cool guests. So that's going to be cool um, because I did cover The Watcher, the case years ago, I think it was 2017 or 2018. And now, of course, Netflix has the series about it, which uh, there's a lot of stuff they threw in there, which I think is really interesting. Um, and what else am I doing? What else am I doing? Uh, yeah, we're, we're good. I'm going to actually have Bob Ruff on too. Uh, we're going to talk about a, another documentary that's on Netflix and another case and a couple other surprises. But I am working right now on my holiday series, which is uh, Holidays in Hell. So what I do is I pick, I pick three cases that happened, one in Thanksgiving, one Christmas and one New Year's that, and just look for things that happened. Uh, the first one that just, what day is this? Yeah, that just came out. Like, I don't even know what day it is. That just came out was about a, a mother that went missing in um uh, Thanksgiving of 2018. And that was a really good case because you know, the detective work was what what broke that case, which was really, really interesting. And yeah, so I got a couple of other ones, older cases, of course, these are older cases, some, I think people maybe haven't heard of because they have not been covered as much because they are older. It's funny how you guys may have seen this when you cover cases that are older and then like two years later, they become a you know a documentary or something on this case that happened in the 1970s or 80s. Like, oh yeah, I know. I knew you did that three years ago. You know, like <laughs> starting next year, we'll have a, you know, every month a new, a new series. And I think I, I am mixing up a little bit more where I just did the, the strictly scripted and narrated where I'm doing those still because those are I still like doing those people like that. That's kind of like the the sound of once upon a crime. But I also am mixing it up with some more where I'm doing a little bit more casual take. Like I said, I'm I'm practicing that and it's uh it's been fun. People like it. I'm getting feedback that they they like to hear the a uh, little bit of a change up like that because I don't have a co-host. You know, it's easier when you can riff off a co-host. Uh, you kind of have to find your footing, I guess. How you how you speak like naturally when you're by yourself. <laughs> it's a little different. Well, I got to give you a big thank you for inviting us on to talk about The Watcher. So now I can at least go through the rest of my life knowing that that wasn't a total waste of my time. <laughs> that something, yeah, it, something's going to come out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's It started out really good. So and I'm right now I'm like, OK, what is happening here now? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, OK, now we're just throwing everything but the kitchen sink in. But that's what Hollywood does. That's what Hollywood does. You know, so, you know, we're, we're, we're purists are, as podcasters, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> purist pod. Hey, you should secure that uh, URL. There you go. Puristpod.com. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I'm a Puritan. <laughs> <laughs> the total Puritan podcast. I am right now researching and about to put out a, an episode about an Amish serial killer. You heard that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's that'll be out next week. Yeah. It's a really interesting story that I didn't know about. I, I'm having fun uh, getting just a lot of information on that one. That's super interesting. Is it a person who is killing Amish people or was it an Amish person killing non-Amish people? Both, actually. Both. Oh, yeah. So just a wild man. Well, because they didn't know until later on that one of the, the, the one of the people was was a victim. They thought it was an accident. But yeah, so there could have been more. I don't know. There's there's a uh, there's rumors they they tried to pin other ones on him and they said they they did all the detective work on it and said it's probably what happened but couldn't quite put the case together so yeah it's really interesting and who would have thunk right Amish serial killer <laughs> I've heard of Amish mob so I guess it could anything could happen right yeah I guess so Amish mob podcast they probably have that already right another URL you should definitely register right now. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah, the hits keep coming. Well, Esther, this has been a lot of fun uh, chatting with you, and uh, we really appreciate your time here. And we're excited to uh, to join you on your show next. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I can't wait. It's going to be great. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Looking forward to actually uh, hanging out with you at CrimeCon next year. And oh, yeah. who knows what will happen? Who who knows how many Amish people we're going to run into and offend? Well, I know I'm going to get Bob Ruff out there and start a fight. 